Norma, Robin talked to her yes, la last night. Yeah, she sounded like she was still dealing with that sickness. So we'll keep her in prayer as well. Uh, but anything else? You know, we've been praying for them for a while. <laughs> yeah, we won't. We won't stop. Yeah, we'll we'll keep praying for them. <laughs> Yeah. We have futons in the youth room, <laughs> but but you'll have to bar the door from the outside because they're exit doors. <laughs> well, either one. <laughs> but. Definitely a time of upheaval. Shannon's back's feeling a little bit better. You can see it in her spirit. Yeah. We'll, we'll pray that that continues. I told my brother, I told my sister to tell my brother-in-law they're on their way up to Hayden, Idaho over the next few days. They're going to go through Olympia on the way. Um, but I, she posted a, a post on her Facebook today saying, we stopped and got donuts, and everyone's giggling and laughing in the back. And I told her, well, I'll pray for you. <laughs> tell, tell Matt, my brother-in-law, that, that I'll be praying for him. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> as he drives with, with the crazies in the back. But uh, I would uh, hope you would do the same thing for me. My crazies hopefully will be asleep when we go to Idaho Tuesday night. But, <laughs> but uh, that, that Riley over there, she likes to see how long she can stay up. Where are, you, where are you going, hon? <laughs> That's a new move. I'll have to keep that in my back pocket for later. <laughs> uh, but, well, anything else? Any other prayer requests or praises? <coughs> we don't pray for people from the other youth groups. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, a brain brain tumor discovered as a result of a concussion. Probably the CT scan involved with that. Uh, the Mooney family doesn't know anything about th that recently. We 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 were with William, uh, their youngest, his seventh grader. He he got a knock in the head on Tuesday night at youth group, and after we finished up here prepping the room for pain, I went to the hospital, and they were still there having a good old time, and. It, apparently it was pretty substantial. He seemed okay at the time, but he developed some symptoms pretty quickly and started having nausea and vomiting, so they took him. Oh, yeah. yeah, so. But that came back all clean, and he said, sound like he's back to his normal self. Yeah, I'm back to normal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the name of the young man? Brody. Brody? Brody. Okay. So Brody has a brain tumor they found dealing with a concussion or found in some, some way and uh, it's never a good place for a tumor. Uh, tumors are never good anyway but there are certain places I, I think I'd rather have them and that's not one of them. Yeah. Oh. I'd like to pray for a subcontractor working with me and his name's Steve. Okay. Big X Marine and uh, I'm saved. He's the one you mentioned is in charge of the guy from Hayden? Yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll pray for the guy from Hayden, too. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, definitely. Well, we've got a few prayer requests on our docket this evening. Does someone want to open with prayer? Take one or two and pray for them, and then I'll close us up and uh, lead us into our study this evening. Does that sound good to everyone? All right. All right. Go for it. Whoever wants to start us off. Thank you for this, uh, this great church family. And we uh, just pray for
the ones that were infected by some kind of steroid or the man down there who was actually keeping him in the hospital. I know that he's a good eye on him. He was safe throughout these uh, trials that come in over at you. He uh, especially prayed for Norma. Father, thank you that we have good report from Pastor Terry and his surgery, and we ask that you would continue to heal him internally as those cuts and those incisions heal. May they do so well without any consequence. And we're grateful, Father, also for the opportunity to minister to those that we interact with on a daily basis and consistently, and we ask that you would open Steve's eyes to see his need for the gospel, to not rely on his own abilities or strengths, and the person that he is, but to recognize his need for his Savior and to respond to the gospel and that Eric would get the opportunity to be the tool through whom you use to accomplish that end. And we ask, Father, that that would be the same for all of us, that we would be sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit's leading, being in a right relationship with you, taking inventory of our walk with you, that we are honestly and genuinely with full confidence knowing that we walk directly in our relationship with you and not by the flesh. Knowing that in those times that you lead us by your Holy Spirit, that you guide us where you want us to go, and that you give us the proper terminology and the proper words at the proper times to interact with those who need a Savior and who need to understand a relationship with you. May that be the case tonight as we each take inventory of our own walk with you. Convict us where we need conviction. Encourage us where that encouragement is likewise needed. And may we operate in faith Trust in you to guide us and teach us by your word and allow the Holy Spirit to be the one controlling our life in this moment as we pursue study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me go start the audio recorder. Well, this evening we're in Jude 111 for the third evening of study. Uh, Norma mentioned that we could probably finish Jude about a year and a half, and we're probably she's probably about right uh, (laughs) if it weren't for vacations and the rest of it. But uh, verse 11 has those three references to Old Testament stories of apostasy and, and examples that illustrate for us the misery and judgment that comes from walking apart from God either rejecting his truth totally or rejecting the path he has laid out in the moment. And so we'll be looking at Jude one eleven this evening in part of the last portion of the Greek. We'll also be dealing with the rebellion of Korah, going back to Numbers chapter 16. But I'd remind you of our characteristics of apostates. Apostasy means to depart from something, and we see Jude puts apostasy in correlation to the faith For some have departed from the faith. And the faith was a term at that time that was used to refer to what God revealed 
about truth and about the Christian way of life, how to walk with him, what he instructs us to do. And so when we look at the completion of the canon of Scripture, that's the faith, the instruction that God has given us. It's doctrine, his teaching. That's what we are to depend upon in a relationship with him as the Holy Spirit teaches us and guides us by his word. And so a departure from that, from his word and the Holy Spirit's leadership, is trespassing against God. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from that unrighteousness, and in fact all unrighteousness, with that confession of known sin. And so a departure from faith can be a complete rejection and rebellion from God. Whether it's once and for all I'm done with this, or whether it's in this moment I'm choosing to fall to the sin nature I have and willingly submit to its leadership over me, taking the bait in the trap of sin. And so whether it's a momentary departure that's corrected or whether it's a continuous departure that's not corrected for a long period of time or perhaps ever, apostasy deals with a departure. In this book, Jude speaks to a departure from God and his and doctrine and truth. And so we're, we're looking at these characteristics of those who are, are apostate in terms of God and his word and what he has passed down through the saints throughout the ages. And we saw that they are dreaming ones. They've dreamed up versions of reality that justify their thoughts, their beliefs, their actions, and then their behavior. Notice there's an order here. Thoughts lead to beliefs. Beliefs produce actions. Actions repeated our behavior. How you think and what you depend upon produces what you do. If your actions aren't matching the standard of God, it's because you have a belief that doesn't match what God says to depend upon. If your belief matches something that God says not to depend upon, then it's something in your thought process that needs to be changed. And therefore, we renovate the mind by the Word of God as taught by the Holy Spirit. The Sunday school kids or youth in Sunday school will get this uh, in two weeks, since there won't be any Sunday school for the youth next week. But in two weeks, they're going to get this whole process as we have dealt with the first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. We've got them enough information now to see this process in action and to put it to paper. Uh, Apostasy starts then first with the thoughts. And the thought then, depending upon a false uh, truth or something that which appears to be right but is wrong, that makes a belief that then produces action, that then produces behavior, and it's repeated over and over again. And so these apostates are dreaming ones. They've dreamed up versions of reality that justified the false apostate thoughts and beliefs and actions and behavior that they had. We also saw that they stained the flesh with color. We mentioned this this morning, that they dyed their flesh for the purpose of making their flesh look better than it really was. And then we saw also that they spoke against those with good reputations and that we saw that that was speaking falsehood against those who have a good repute. Those who have honor and esteem that's the result of good behavior and reputation. All this goes back down to verse 8, I believe, where it says, Yet in the same manner these men also, by dreaming, defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. And that last one, reject authority, means that they remove themselves from positions of authority. It's not that the authority itself was taken off of the, the proper place of authority. It's that they then removed themselves out from underneath the authority and made themselves the authority. So it wasn't a rebellion or revolution that, that replaced the authority with a, a new authority. They just said, no, that authority is not over me. They've displaced that authority, and they became their own authority. So rejecting authority we dealt with in verse 8 said, identified removing positions of authority from governing them. Whoever's in charge doesn't get to tell me what to do. That's the concept, whether it's active and, and purposeful in that manner or whether it's passive and just the result of their apostasy. Verse 10, then we saw that they revile things they don't understand. They speak falsehood. Again, the word blasphemia was used. They speak falsehood against what they don't understand in their own mind's eye. Remember that word that we saw for understand wasn't comprehend. It was to understand a fact or to see a fact in your own mind's eye. So in their mind, the reality that was right there in front of them, they did not see and therefore they did not understand it. And we saw this was the result of them looking at things from their own perspective, not seeing things for what they actually are. They said then that's the result of knowing things naturally, which is knowledge developed from a human viewpoint, 
result of that unreasoning animals, they operate as those beings that God created, which, which do not have the ability to process thought. Uh, they operate off of instinct, and they are reactionary. They're not purposeful in thought. Uh, an animal does not get up in the morning and go, oh, I think I'd like to go for a walk today. Which place shall I walk today? No, they get up and they go through routines. doesn't mean they don't go for a walk. My dogs do it every morning. But the thought process is not in there like it is in humans. It's one of the main things that separates us from animals. That and the, the nature of representing God that God created humanity with, and he did not create animals with that unique essence, the soul that represents his unique essence. They are corrupted, verse 10 says, and it means that they, or it speaks to the decay. As they continue in apostasy, they further get more apostate. They decay farther along and down the road. We then took off into verse 11. Verse 11 says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the, the error of Balaam and per perished in the rebellion of Korah. And when we looked at the word woe there, it's from the Greek word uai, pretty close to woe in English if you think about it, uai, which, which denounces their behavior and expresses a, a concept of misery and judgment that belongs to those who are apostate. So when, he, when Jude says or writes uai, He's identifying that they have misery and judgment in their path and in their circumstances in their life, and they will have a judgment coming up as well, but that their behavior is to be denounced. Woe to them. Misery and judgment is in their path, and we do not participate in that behavior. We denounce their behavior. That led us then to look at the the way of Cain, and we saw in the way of Cain that Cain's way, you can take a look at your summary review, number eight in the principles, Cain way was, Cain's way was characterized by self-righteousness, self-reliance, and opposition to God, and we saw that from Genesis 4, 3 to 16. Cain's departure from truth was centered on pride, on self. What can I do? Well, I'm a tiller of the ground. I will produce what I can produce, and I will offer that to the Lord that he would accept what I can do for my strength. And there's the self-reliance. And the opposition to God is, because, is in that area where God has ex ex expected and expressed to them a need for the shedding of blood for the covering of their sins. Now, apostates, just like Cain, are taken into the area of self-righteousness, self-reliance, and opposition to God as a result of choosing to depart from truth. When you depart from God, you operate in self-reliance. You're dependent upon yourself. Yourself is led by your flesh. You produce from your area of strength human good, which looks good, but is counterfeit. And you produce from your area of strength rebellion, which Hebrews 12 talks about both the area of strength and the area of weakness, talking about that which so easily entangles us and impedes our progress toward the objective of spiritual advance. We then saw Balaam. We spent time with Balaam last time that we met. Balaam's utilized as an illustration of an apostate who received judgment as a result of his departure from truth. Now, when we looked at Balaam, number 11 on your principles, we identified that Balaam disobediently went with representatives from Balak's kingdom, the kingdom of Moab, departing from God's statement to him, the statement in Numbers 22, 20 to 1. And we saw there that the word buah from the Hebrew, when God says, if the men have come to you in the New American Standard, then go with them. And then we see in verse 21 that Balaam got up, or verse 22, Balaam got up and went with them, and God got angry at him for going. And we said something doesn't measure up here. And so we went back then real quickly, and I gave to you the Hebrew translation from the Kal Ketal form of Buah, or Ba'u, excuse me, which identifies the condition. When Balaam goes to God and says, what shall I do with these men who have come? God says, if they come, future, completed action, not if they have come, past action, like the New American Standard translates, then go to them, and because they did not come to him after God set that condition upon him, and he went anyway, God was angry and was going to slay him. 
the Hebrew there is important. And some, diff- some translations show that a little more clearly by leaving out the if the men have come, making it past tense into English. The call katal is a active voice, meaning that those men come to him in a completed action, not that they have already in the past done so. Uh, the katal form can be past present or future in Hebrew, and we have it being if in the future they come to you in a completed action in the middle of the night or between now and the morning, then go with them. He did not obey that condition. Instead, he went with them, and we saw that his departure was motivated by his desire to receive material goods in exchange for doing the wishes of Balak. Now, as a result of Balaam's departure, From truth, he was led off of the course of the correct path by materialism for a path which erred to be what God had said. And that's where we get that little simple thing where God says, if this happens, then go do this. If that thing does not happen, do not go. That's apostasy. Again, apostasy can be large. It can be in momentary, minute-by-minute moments. And we need to focus on more the moment-by-moment ones because as we see, And as we saw in verse 10, when you step out into a slight departure, it's very simple without correction to continue to depart more and more and more and get further off of the course. Think about walking in the woods for that one. If you're on a trail and something you see 50 yards off of the trail catches your attention and you go off the trail, you've departed from the path. And if that thing keeps moving farther and farther away, if you're not paying attention, you have no idea where the path is and you go farther and farther away. When our attention is on that which entices us, and it's apart from God's grace and his provision, we walk off the path. And if we don't pay attention, because, hey, I'm following something here, I've left this path behind, and stop what we're doing and following that thing, correct through repentance and conf- confess and get back on that path, we will continue to wander farther and farther away from where God would have us be walking in that moment. Praise be to God that he has the omniscience to know where that trail picks up later down the road and to know how loud he needs to yell for us to hear his voice and come back to him. It's by his loving kindness that we are led to repentance. So we've dealt with Balaam, and we've dealt with Cain, and now this evening we look at the opposition of Korah as we take a look at Ketai Antologia to Kore Apollonta. So back in Jude one eleven this evening, we will translate out the Greek text to identify the reference, then we will transition to Numbers chapter 16 for the rest of the evening. The word chi is common. We see it frequently. It just means and. It has a logical relationship, so it's logically related to the statements before it. This is now a third example of the misery and judgment that comes to those who are apostate and walk in apostasy. So related to Cain, we had Balaam, and related to Balaam, we have now the rebellion of Korah. And all three of those illustrations relate to the apostates who snuck into the church for the purpose of changing God's grace for licentiousness. And logically related, te ontologia, the opposition You might be able to transliterate those Greek characters on T. We would say it in English if we spelled it with the corresponding sound anti. And the anti gives you that opposing concept. Legia is a compound word meaning opposing the word of an individual or what has been said, the message of an individual. And when you look at your summary view in your expanded translation, It's the third or fourth line, starting in the middle, the act of opposition against something. And it's a noun in the feminine gender, referring to someone who acts in opposition to someone or something. They were poured out And logically related to them being poured out to pursue rewards as Balaam did. They acted in opposition to someone or something. Here we're going to see Korah as that example illustrating what these apostates that Jude is referring to did. 
Now, antelegia is in the instrumental case. This opposition is a tool that's used to accomplish something. It's the instrument through which something occurred. And it's feminine, so it's based on response. So we put through an act in opposition, or act of opposition to someone or something, based on response. What is it that opposition responds to? Well, it depends on the stimulus. If I come to my child and I say, go rob a bank, my child is told by God's word to obey their parent. There's a little phrase there, in the Lord. My child is told to obey because they're to obey their, their parent because they're to obey God. So God has the ultimate authority. The parent gets that sub contracted, for a better term, authority. And so it's not that the parent is the only authority. They are an authority. God is the ultimate authority over the child. So if I go to my child and I tell them, go rob a bank, they have a higher authority to answer to. And their disobedience to my command to them is warranted because in order for them to obey God, they have to disobey me. And I am disobeying God to give them that command. And so following God's command on that is important. Now, if I get upset with my child because they say, no, I'm not going to rob a bank, and I say, well, you're just an apostate because you're in opposition to me. Oh, <laughs> ah, that the ground would swallow me up. <laughs> And we'll see that's exactly what it did to Korah with their rebellion. The opposition is in response. I and mean, whether opposition is warranted or not is an important thing to sort out. If our government says you may not pray, you may not read your Bible, you may not hold Bible class, then we oppose them based on response to God and his word. If God, if God says you are to walk faithfully to me, and we say no because our flesh says this is more enjoyable over here, we are to oppose the flesh. It's based on response. We have to respond to the suggestion of the leadership over us to say yes to it or no to it. And that's by our free will. So our response is important there. And what we oppose, we should oppose based on response. Here, we see that the Korah, or these individuals, these apostates, were acting in the same way that the opposition of Korah was acting. And Korah responded to something specific. And it wasn't God. We'll see that when we get there. So opposition, what you oppose when someone says this is what to do, or this is what I've established, if you oppose that, you better be sure that you are right with God in doing so. Because even the authorities that lead us wrongly they will be judged for it, but we also have a responsibility to walk faithful to God in the authorities. We can't just ignore the authority over us. There is a time, there is a place. To Kore is literally of the Kora. Kore is the Greek word that, that goes back to number 16, dealing with Kora, one of the Israelites. Kora, you'll see, is masculine. He's an initiator. He initiated a response. He chose to respond to what was said with opposition. Anytime that we respond to something, it's because we choose to do so. Maybe pre-programmed choice, where the child is making a ton of noise in the back of the car, and your pre-programmed choice that you've already done a million times is to reach your hand back there and try and slap them or whatever. A great story from one of the youth Him and his brother, a long time ago, they've left our youth department, told this story around a campfire at Creation Fest in Emaclaw one night, and it was just hysterical. The two of them working in tandem, telling the, the story was phenomenal. And what they were telling was how they used to get on their mother's nerve, and she would chase them around with a broom and with her sandal, and they would hide under the bed until she calmed down. And she... She probably was well warranted with these, knowing these two to be chasing them. <laughs> but as they would hide in the bed, they, they, they couldn't finish telling the story because they'd get a few words out and they would just be busting their gut laughing. 
And so one, one of the brothers would get a few words out, and he would just succumb to the hilarity of it, and the other brother would be recovered then, and he would get the next few on it. And, and just the picture they gave of them hiding under the bed as far back, as tight as they could get, and their mom's little sandal coming underneath there, and the way that they were saying it was just phenomenal. Pre-programmed response. <laughs> we, we have this process. Thoughts lead to beliefs. Beliefs lead to actions. Actions lead to behavior. Behavior is pre-programmed. Actions are programmed by what you depend upon in your thought process. I don't recommend broomsticks or sandals <laughs> unless you're looking for a comedy hour. But we don't spare the rod and spoil the child, and that's clear in Scripture. So when we, when we deal with this, apo- this opposition, again, it's based on response, but our response is a choice. We choose how we respond. And based upon how we've chosen in the past, we can either function in autopilot, responding how we would normally respond, because we've already walked ourselves down there, and done that action time and time again, or we can stop in the moment and say, how will I choose to respond to this? And it's important, if you're going to stop the process of temptation from just overwhelmingly defeating you in your, in your walk with the Lord, when you f- see that temptation, to purposely choose what you do. If you choose the wrong thing purposely, it's still the wrong thing. But your awareness will drive you nuts on the other side. <laughs> When we recognize what's in the trap, we should choose to follow what God says, knowing that he knows what's best. We should. We are benefited in doing so. Something to add there? I looked the other way on purpose. (laughs) I was looking at Emily, but her head's down. So anytime we have a response like opposition to something, we have to choose what we're going to do. Someone says something, you choose how you respond. Korah's initiator, he chose to oppose something. And Apollonta identifies that these apostates, through the act of opposing someone or something, just like Korah, they, indicative mood really, middle voice, participated, In the action, in a point in time, to be destroyed. Through an act of opposition similar to that of Korah, they really participated in the action in a point in time to be destroyed. Now, the reference we have takes us to Numbers chapter 16. So turn in your Bibles to Numbers 16. We'll see the rebellion of Korah. We'll identify Korah's motivation, and Korah has some associates. So we'll be able to term this the rebellion of Korah and associates, something that drives me uh, mildly pleasure (laughs) and gives me some some great, great fun and joy to say. In Numbers chapter 16, Moses records the rebellion of Korah. It says, Now Korah the son of Izhar the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dethon and Abarim, those are the, the associates, Dethon and Abarim, the sons of Eliab, and On, what a great name. What's your name? On. <laughs> and On, another associate, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. And they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Sounds like some church stories I've heard recently. So we have Moses and Aaron, the established leaders, Aaron being the high priest, Moses being the intermediary, essentially, for God's voice to the Israelites. And these who are with Korah, Korah and Associates, rise up, and they're challenging that leadership. They make a few bold statements, statements that come out of arrogance because they're not founded in reality. 
They say to Moses and Aaron in verse 3, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? A couple of problems there, hopefully, that you see. Was Israel, in the individuals within the tribes of Israel, were they holy in their walk and in their position? If they were holy in their position, then they would not need the sacrifices. If they were holy in their walk, they would not need their sacrifices. They were chosen by God, and he was covering their sins for a time until such time as the Messiah could make them holy, both positionally and then experientially. But as these individuals went through (laughs) the discipline of God, somehow they got the idea that they were holy, every single one of them. First, error and departure from truth. The question that came out of that error, though, is why do you, Moses, and you, Aaron, exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, can you see how they misunderstood what Moses and Aaron were doing? Did Moses and Aaron exalt themselves above the assembly? No. They were commissioned their roles. Moses even tried to back out of it. That's why Aaron was tagged along. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a, a, a grace thing or a discipline thing for Moses. Probably a little bit of both, sounds like. So their, their view that they and the rest of Israel were holy caused them to think that Moses and Aaron were just acting holier than thou and exalted themselves as the leaders of Israel. They didn't recognize and they forgot that God had established Aaron in his position and Moses in his position. Verse 4, we pick up the story from here. When Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. So do this. Take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company. Hey, look at that. Korah and associates. Korah and all your company. And put fire in them, and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Kind of interesting how he uses their words back on them. It's not very good in a marriage when that happens, but here I think it's kind of warranted. So he says, go out, get your censers, go through the process, come back tomorrow, and we'll see who is exalted by God, not by himself. Then Moses, verse 8, says to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it not enough for you that God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel, their Levites, to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? And that he has brought you near, Korah, and all your brothers, sons of Levi, is with you? And are you seeking for the priesthood also? This is what they were opposing. They were working in the temple, They saw the priest functioning in the high priest role, and that's what they were pursuing. Verse 11, Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord, but as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? Moses then sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram, the son of Eliab, but they said, We will not come. Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness, but you would also lord it over us? And here he is, the leader of Israel, giving them a command to come up and do something, and they don't even allow that to be their authority. Well, here it is, you're just lowering that authority that we're, gonna, that we're opposing over us. What, what, do, what do we have here? Reject authority. You are not the authority over me. Who are you to tell me what to do? Verse 14, indeed, oh, verse 15, Then Moses became very angry <laughs> and says to the Lord, Do not regard their offering." This is about as good as a human statement can get in terms of what we can say against somebody. Remember Michael the archangel in Jude, when he wrestled with Satan, the serpent, for the body of Christ, he, or body of Moses, excuse me, he, he didn't rebuke him, but rather he said, let the Lord rebuke you. <laughs> oh man, I, I, there's so much more power in that. Probably wrongly enjoyed. 
But Moses becomes very angry and says, Do not regard their offering to the Lord. I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done harm to any of them. And Moses said to Korah, You and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you and they, along with Aaron. Each of you take his fire pan and put incense on it. And each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 fire pans. Also you and Aaron shall each bring his fire pan. Verse 18, so they each took his own censer and put fire on it and laid incense on it. And they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. Judgment and misery. Why? Verse 22, But they fell on their faces and said, O God, thou God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, wilt thou be angry with the entire congregation? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel. Remember, Dathan and Abiram wouldn't come up. So he went to them with the elders of Israel following him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing that belongs to them, lest you be swept away in all their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan and Abiram, and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the doorway of their tents, along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. Verse 28, And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. What do you think? happened. Verse 31, then it came about as he finished speaking all these words that the ground that was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men belonging who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, The earth may swallow us up. Fire also came, from, came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Wow. <laughs> time and time again, and the same thing for us. We still just don't seem to get it. Now in between Jude 1, 6 of your handouts, and a note on the angelic reference, you have a diagram of Sheol, the abode of the dead in the heart of the earth. And paradise was the place for pre-cross or crucifixion believers. And Luke 16, 19 to 31 explains that to us. Torments, which is known from the Greek word Hades, is the holding place for all unbelievers prior to their being thrown into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. You can look at, again at the story in Luke 16, 19, 31, as well as 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20. Number 16, 30 to 33, of which we just read, gives us this reference. Then the heart of the earth, there is the abode of the dead. Revelation 20, 13 to 15 identifies this as well. And we've already seen in the pit from Jude 1, 6 that that's where the angels who left their proper abode were put and stored, bound under chains of darkness. And so that reference to Sheol comes in handy for us once more. And the reason is because Korah illustrates that apostates oppose the message of God and his leaders. These apostates in Jude chose to respond against God and his leadership. And as God led men of good repute, which they've already, according to verse 8, have blasphemed, spoken falsehood against, they rejected those God put into place over them, they rejected the leadership of those men, and they rejected God's leadership. If God has established a leader, 
whether that leader is faithful to God or not, we have to respect the position. It's a harsh harmony, but you see it when you look at Saul and David. Saul was not leading as he should. David had the opportunity to slay him and said, no, I will not slay the Lord's anointed. There's something to recognize about who God has put into position. And if that person falters, it does not mean you take up the mantle. God has to give you that mantle. And spouses, uh, wives for your husbands, husbands, you don't take that authority over Christ of the family. Christ has the authority over you. The wife, you have that authority under your husband. And so we need to make sure that if the husband fails, as husbands do, ladies, that you as wives do not try and pick up the mantle for him. Because now you have departed. And husbands, when you fail, you need to recognize that your authority is Christ, not your own flesh. And repent and again allow him to lead you so that you don't put your wife in a vulnerable position and so that you don't cause further harm to the family by walking in apostasy. I don't know what the wives of Korah, Abarim, and Dathan thought about their opposition to the high priest of Israel, but they were swallowed up as well. Also, I believe this passage, on a lighter note, Ruins the whole idea that you can't take it with you when you go. Because <laughs> if you notice, it says, in all their possessions. A well, you know, the wives were glaring at me, so. <laughs> it does. So don't take up the mantle. <laughs> no, apostasy has its problems, doesn't it? And we'll continue to see that throughout the book of Jude. And we'll continue through until verse 16 or so. We'll continue to be getting descriptions and illustrations. And then we start to transition into what do we, as those who are walking with God and confessing our sin to get back when we falter into apostasy, what is our response to those apostates? And we'll have to see that in about three weeks' time as we continue on looking at apostasy in Jude. Any questions or clarification needed about what was said this evening? Clear. My wife has given me some eyes, what, what, and not, not the right kind of eyes. <laughs> They're like the big old bugged out eyes. I don't, I, was that a message or? No. Okay. <laughs> Did I say leaving on Wednesday? Oh, I appreciate your support. <laughs> All right, well, if there's nothing else, no comments or... Oh, go ahead. You weren't here. You don't get to ask questions. Okay, go ahead. Oh, did you? Okay, you can ask questions. <laughs> Two of them. Okay. Go to Numbers 22. If you didn't hear that, she asked, you said, I love when she starts her questions with you said, you said that animals are unreasoning. They don't, they don't have thought and can't produce uh, that conscious thought process. Yet the donkey spoke. So what is the harmony there? Uh, we're looking down at Numbers 22. Uh, 23, the story of the, the donkey speaking. Gentlemen, if it's any consolation, the donkey in Hebrew is feminine. <laughs> I appreciate that. Start praying. I'm going to need it. <laughs> I'd hold on to the tables, but if the ground opens up, the tables are going with me. Uh, it says, The Lord opened the mouth in verse 28. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a mockery of me, if, I, if there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. The donkey said back to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, which was with, in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed all the way 
to the ground. It's a pretty good place to stop. <laughs> Maybe looking for that heart of the earth, or the blood of the dead and the heart of the earth. Uh, th- this would be a miraculous intervention into the, pr- the typical situation. And it, that part in verse 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. God can make donkeys talk, even feminine ones. <laughs> So this, this would be what we consider a miraculous deviation from the principles of animal creation. That would be the answer I would give to you. Well, Here's your second question. No, I just think it's, like, it's like And, and he responded to Balaam's statement back. Yeah, Again, so miraculous that intervention. Where did that reason come from? Yeah. The Lord who opened the mouth of the donkey. So it just it that I, I believe that's an aspect and a part of it. It's the, the miraculous deviation from the standard with God giving that donkey that ability for that time to get the point across, and then God opens the eyes to see the angel. That miraculous deviation. You can't look at any other animal and see a thought process. We even scientifically, the closest thing you get is a, a chimpanzee or a, an ape who can l- memorize signs, and we've actually had this conversation before a few years back, I believe, where you can memorize signs and mimic things that they visually see and interact with, but not piece together a syntactical linguistic statement on their own. Uh, the, the story that I think we referenced at that time a few years back at youth group was uh, about the scientist who had gotten pregnant, had a miscarriage, or her baby had died, and when she came back to the ape, the ape saw that she was sad and gave the, the sign language sign, uh, that's, that's potty, I don't know what that is, but sign language sign for sad. And it's, in my opinion, it's a visible cue that the, the ape responded with. And it was taken by the scientist as it understands that I feel sadness and it is telling me that I am sad. And I think it actually gave her a hug or wrapped its arms around or something like that. So no, there, there's scientific viewpoint that that was conscious thought. Um, Animals seem to communicate to one another, but not in a syntactical message, thought process-based communication. It's instinctive. Uh, the phrase that we saw in verse, where was that, back in verse 8? No, where is it? Is it verse 10? There it is, verse 10. But these men revile things which they do not understand, things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals. The description we have there from verse 10 is from the word alagi, alaga, which actually should be alagi, I believe. No, it's alaga, which means without message or without, without reason. That's what the word itself means. That's why we said they're unreasoning animals. So... I get miraculous intervention from the and deviation from the standard there, in my opinion. But. You find me another example in there. I'm interested in hearing it too, because it's just that one. That, that that one moment in time is all we have portrayed here. Um, does that mean the donkey has a stored up memory of everything that he's done? Or is that just God's way of communicating to get Balaam's attention there? Um, It doesn't say that God told the donkey what to say and, and spoke through the donkey. It opened the donkey's mouth. So I, I understand where you're coming from, but it's a miraculous deviation. Well, good question. <laughs> well, if the Lord opens the thing's mouth, I mean, I guess it makes sense, but yeah. Nope. 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 Well, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's a good question. Are there reasoning animals? Magpie, crow. 
all of his pellet gun arch nemeses. Nemeses. <laughs> all right. Well, let's. <laughs> I think Roadrunner was the reasonable one out of the two. <laughs> well, let's pray and we'll dismiss. Father, thank you that while you give us a glimpse into things and you teach us how things operate, that we get to see your power at work. Give us an understanding, Father, of that which you've revealed and a knowledge of what you haven't revealed. That we would know carefully where to draw the line so as not to allow our own thoughts to guide us into areas where you have not spoken. Protect us, Father, from apostasy and from our own desires as we daily have to put aside and deal with not subjecting ourselves to the leadership of the flesh. And we recognize that we can only do so by first choosing to depend upon and trust you to lead us and guide us moment by moment. Thank you for all these here and their desire to pursue an understanding of your word and to work through some concepts along the way. In Jesus' name, amen.